Hi there, guys. Okay, so um, I know that some of you are curious as to exactly how um, Skeetersoft NP3 works. I don't want to uh, have a video that lasts necessarily until the end of time, uh, but I do want to have at least a little quick video here to sort of show you what goes on with this. So um, I'll show you sort of what goes into playing a game. We're going to use a different uh, season, though. So uh, the season that I've chosen here is 1927. I have a uh, list uh, or a huge collection of these seasons, you can see, and we're going to look at 27 for a reason, I mean, just because it's going to be fun. So when you go into this, the stuff that we do beforehand, you have all sorts of stuff, options and rules, roster. It's not really organized that well. I mean, these are replay things. This is a replay type thing. You look at the games played, and then you get your starting lineup, and you can play the game. You can play a league game or an exhibition game or whatever. We'll go play a little uh, exhibition here. We'll have the Yankees play against, um, I don't know, uh, have them play against the athletics. Um, and uh, we'll just go ahead and go with the uh, default lineup, probably for both teams. So the first thing that you're going to note is that all the players are available for both teams, right, because this is sort of the way that the game works. Um, all of the players are available by default. If you go over here to, like, the roster, everybody's going to be available. What that means is that if you're playing a replay, you kind of have to go in and you have to make changes, um, like, either by hand, which is what I do, or you can download a transaction file, which will include some transactions. Now, I will warn you that the transaction files in the NP3 community are incomplete. If you're trying to do, like, a full-on Diamond Mine-style replay, it will kind of work. It'll tell you who was traded where, but it won't tell you who was injured at what time. Um, or um, things about, like, say, Honus Wagner, you know, uh, holding out the first three days of the 1908 season and stuff like that. That stuff is pretty important to some of us. It's designed so that you go through here and you just play one game at a time. And in theory, if you have a transaction sheet and you play it this way, it will keep track of just about everything for you, and then you can keep track of the number of uh, games you've played and all this stuff. I, I don't do it that way, right, because I don't want to use um, real-life lineups and uh, uh, real-life lineups when I play. I just want to really play the game. So we're going to sit here. We're going to play this game, take another look really quick at the uh, Yankees lineup. Of course, m some of us have had this lineup, like, memorized, you know, so we know everybody who's um, playing on the Yankees here. It's not a surprise. And, yeah, I think we will start uh, Wade Hoyt there. For the athletics, we take a look here and see. This was a good athletics team with Ty Cobb hitting um, in the uh, number three hole. So once you have that set up, you click over here on Start Game. And now we'll get into the um, uh, fun of it. So I will show this sort of the way that I normally play the game. We start this game off. What we can see here is we have the fielding rating for the defense. That's probably the first important thing. And the second important thing is where the uh, pitcher is. So the fielding rating, as we go back here to the rules, will tell us where on the boards we're looking Eh, it doesn't uh, depend on the uh, board results 11, 1 through 11, but for 12 through 45, we know that, what was this again? This is um, fielding rating 38 and 31. It's, it's fielding 2. It doesn't tell you fielding 2 here, which it probably should. It would be a little bit helpful, but it's okay. We go back over here to the uh, boards, and we know that we're in fielding 2 for everything. Bases are empty, and this is where the results are going to come from. Now, those results might be different depending upon the rule and whether it's uh, some sort of play that involves a certain infielder or not, right? So it's somewhat complex. Look at Grove. He's a grade 9Q1. What, uh, to figure that one out, we go back over here again. We're going to look at uh, the advanced pitching chart. This is advanced pitching chart B because it's 1927. And we have a grade 9 um, Q1. So we go to Q1, grade 9. It's going to be a B for the first and second inning, C in the third, and then um, his adjustment down to a D will come after eight innings and two uh, base runners. When he has uh, the 10th inning, he will automatically become a D. So that's basically what all of that means. Now, the way that the flow of the game works is I roll these dice, right? So I've got these dice right here. You can see I hold them up here as well. You can see it easier in this camera, not as much glare. Um, you read the dice, the red die first, and then the white die second. These aren't actually Apatow-style die, by the way. You can see it maybe a little bit. Uh, there you go. You can see it a little bit better there. Um, these are metal die. They're, so they're... Um, these dice are made of metal. They're going to be heavier than normal dice. This um, has a magnetic thing, this little thing here, this little house that we have for it. Works well in trying to keep the uh, dice from uh, falling all over the place, but sometimes I make mistakes and throw it wrong and weird things happen. Um, and I don't think that the metal um, por portion of this has hurt my electronics at all, but, you know, who knows? Maybe I'm actually, like you know, hurting something or whatever. Or, I'm sorry, the magnetic thing here. Maybe I'm frying all my data. I didn't know it. Whatever. So that's what we roll. 
when we roll it, we read the red die first and then the white die second. So um, here, if we uh, get a little bit of glare away, there you go. You can see that is a two and a one for a 21. Right, so if that were the rule, we would then look over here on the card under uh, result 21. Um, the way that this works is we actually put the dice roll in here and the game will locate that roll for us. We can change it if we go over to user preferences so that um, we have to manually click the number um, that comes up. And um, you know we might actually do that here just um, for the purpose of showing how the game works and how the game is played. So we'll try this, all right? We have Earl Combs um, up against Lefty Grove, the first batter of this game. We're not going to go too far. We'll go through this slowly and show you what happens. I like to roll the dice by hand, by the way. You can have the computer roll the dice if you want, um, but um, I prefer to roll by hand. Oh, and look at this. Or if I do it by click, I have to actually click on the number here. So that's even better. That way we can see exactly how this works. The first roll is going to be a 35. So uh, let's see if we can get some of this um, uh, glare away. Yeah, there you go. You can see the 3 and the 5. We call that a 35 in Appalan. And so we go over here to his card, and uh, we see 35 right there. So we will click on roll 35. The result is a 9, right? So the way that this works, I don't have the boards up in front of me, right? This isn't really designed to be a tutorial game. We have to go back over here to the boards and we will look up uh, play result nine with a B on the mound. Remember that uh, Grove is a B. We look at a nine with a B on the mound and nine is a single over short. And so that's gonna be a base hit. In other words, the B does not stop the nine. And so what we have as a result is here a single over short for Combs. And so he's now on first base and then we click on the next card. It'll be Mark uh, Koenig up next. So uh, Mark comes up, uh, probably going to bunt with him here. I'm guessing that's the way that they would play it. So we click on bunt. Now, when we click on bunt, that's going to change things a little bit here. Sorry, it's uh, work trying to tell me um, to whatever. I'm not going to get into that. We have to go over here to the bunt boards with a runner on first base, and that's going to change things significantly because if he hits a, gets a one play result number, it's just going to be a bunt. It's not going to matter that much. So we'll see what Mark does here. We'll roll, and then we'll go back to the boards and take a look. His roll is, uh, let's see here. We uh, get the glare away for a second. Um, it's hard to see where it's coming from. The roll is a 12, and it's kind of be kind of hard to see. We'll uh, pull this over here. That's a little bit either, easier, right? A 1 and a 2, so it's a 12. There we go, 12. So we click on the 12 for a 25. Now, there is a little E that pops up. The reason why is because we have this E next to the result, right? You can see that right here. E is next to the result, which means that there's a possibility of an error. How is this determined? This is determined by looking at this number and seeing if it's an error um, in the boards or not. We'll go back and we'll look at that in a second. There's an error randomizer nowadays in NP3. This is a little complex, and this isn't part of the board game that um, changed this from a 20 to a 22. So the error randomizer makes this happen as a potential error. So we'll go ahead and roll. Here, since it's 1927, the range is from an 11 to a 16. And uh, the rule, as you can see, is a 53. So it's a 5 and a 3. Uh, there we go. 5 and a 3. So that's not between 11 or 16. So the rule is a 53. That means it will default back to the original rule, which is a uh, 25, which means that the bunt is a pop-up. Over to the catcher, catcher uh, uh, Mickey Cochrane uh, catches it and then throws over to first to uh, double off the uh, runner. So really poor bunt there by Mark Koenig. There's a couple of things that happen there that we have to look at, right? First thing is that the result was originally going to be a 20 on that 53. So uh, the way that the little ear system works is the game will look here to this number. 53's result is a 20. Originally in Skeetersoft, that number would tell you whether a little e comes into play or not. So you'd see a little e in your roll, and then you look over here at this uh, 53 result and say, wait a second, is this an error according to the boards that we're on? On the sacrifice play board, a 20 is not an, it, it is an error actually, I'm sorry, be safe in an error, the runner goes to second. Um, Skeetersoft internally will change that to a different error number. Um, and this uh, other error number would also be another error. Um, I, as I understand this, if the internal adjuster changes to, like, say, a 19 or a 17, you wouldn't have to roll for the little e because it's not a potential error. So little e only comes into play when there's a potential error. 
the little e role was outside of the little e range. And so we defaulted back to the original role, which was a 25. Now, a 25 here is a double play. It's a pop-up bunt, runner double off a of first. So pop-up to the catcher, and then catcher to first for the double play. That's how that sequence works. So um, just like that, there's two away, and uh, we've seen how we kind of shift from one board to the next. And also, we had a uh, an example right away of how the little e system works. So now we click on the uh, next button, and we have Babe Ruth up there next. This is, as you can see, this is kind of a complex process. This is why I don't necessarily go over this um, in the uh, course of a game, because it would take us quite a while to play through a game if we're flipping through the boards and trying to get this figured out and get that figured out, right? Uh, Skeetersoft NP3 was originally designed to be sort of a um, a uh, sort of advancement on the APA theme for people who were old uh, APA fans like me um, who wanted a game that was um, a little bit uh, more realistic and um, had a few more options and was also easier to play. The flow of the game, since when you know how to play, you don't have to sit down and think through this all the time. The flow of the game is faster than um, the APA Master game, a little bit slower than the APA Basic game. So back in the days, I could do a game, card and dice, usually in about 15 minutes, then she get the boards memorized. Although, honestly, I probably was getting things a little bit wrong. I think most of us do. Um, and uh, so, anyway, that's uh, sort of the thing that would happen. I'm not sure why Lefty Grove is showing his one inning pitch. He hasn't had a full inning yet. Whatever. Babe Ruth is up next. We'll roll for him as well and just sort of see what uh, Ruth can do. His roll is a 25 for an 8. So we click on 25 and we get result 8 which is a ground out from uh, the uh, to the shortstop uh, Bully, who throws over to first base to Dykes uh, for the third out. And then automatically it has uh, Wade Hoyt in the field, and this is what the Yankees fielding rating looks like. So um, uh, what happened here is uh, we go back here to um, our rules and back here to the normal boards. There was a B on the mound. Babe Ruth rolled an eight. It's, uh, I'm sorry, it's actually a fly out to center field because that's the fielding when there are two outs. My mistake. He rolls an eight, it's an out, right? It ends up actually being a fly out to uh, center field since uh, that star indicates with two men out. So it was a fly out over to uh, Al Simmons. And there you go. We go to the bottom of the first. Now we'll see what happens here as well. So you have Max Bishop up here for the uh, athletics. And uh, Bishop rolls a 23 for a 28. So as a ground ball over to Koenig, the shortstop throws to first for the out. Where is this on the board? So we have to go over here. We go down to 28, um, fielding two, but this depends upon the shortstop. This is the advanced fielding rules. So when we go over to fielding rules, we see that 28 is the shortstop. The fielding rating depends upon the shortstop's fielding number. So if we were playing this in um, by hand, we'd have to know that Koenig has a 7 um, uh, uh, as the shortstop. Usually when you write down your, uh, uh, your score sheet, you would put this number down so that you could look it up easily. That's a 7. I, I know already that's going to be fielding 2 because I've played this. I'm sorry, fielding 3. I've played this so many times. So we should be looking at fielding 3 for the shortstop every time that comes up. Um, now just so happens that we know, um, because we know the boards well, that fielding three, that's going to be a ground ball um, to shortstop who throws out uh, the uh, runner, uh, the batter out at first. In fact, you'll notice that there are no errors that are introduced um, in fielding one, two, or three in any of these cases. It's the error numbers up closer in which this really makes a difference. But that doesn't mean that you can just ignore this, because when you have runners on base, that could be, you know, it could mean the difference between a potential double play or a potential um, fielder's choice and a guy being thrown out at first, and all sorts of wacky things can happen, right? With bases low, uh, bases empty, you don't really have to worry about it that much. So there's one out. Here now is Walt French. But yeah, just so you know, that's what's happening behind the scenes here in the game. It's doing this sort of complex thing where, okay, it notes that it's this number, so we're going to look at uh, fielding three for Koenig, not fielding two for the infield, which is this 32. One out, and here's Walt French, who rolls 44 for a seven. That's going to be a base hit. I know this automatically because I've played this a lot. So, um, and that's uh, what it says here, single to right off of Hoyt. What happened here is we go back to these boards. Hoyt is a B, and the rule here is a seven. A uh, result is a seven, which is a single to right with the bases empty. So that's how that worked. And uh, we'll go back over here, click on next card, and see what Ty Cobb will do. So what do you think? Should we do something with French? I always like to look... I've explained this in an earlier video. See if he has an 11 or not. If he doesn't have an 11, I won't hit and run with him. We're not going to bunt with Cobb. That wouldn't make much sense. Um, and so the rule for Cobb is a 12 for a 25. 
there is a little E roll again. Remember, the little E, and it's in a pre uh, predictable place, is always there. It means that this 15 potentially would be an error. That's going to be the left fielder, I believe. Um, so let's just take a look. It's changed to an 18, so we'll be able to have a uh, look really quick and see. I think it's actually changing that roll first and then calculating it based on that error number changing due to the um, internal online or inside system. It doesn't matter. Cobb's roll is a 66, and so that's going to be a ground ball to second base since it defaults back to the 25. Second baseman Lazari fields it, flips over to Koenig for the out at first. Cobb is safe on the fielder's choice. So to explain what's happening here again... Roll was a 25, um, but um, it's not a double play uh, because the fielder it involves is not in fielding uh, uh, one. So, but what we're going to look up first is to figure out the little e roll again. His was a, the result here was a 15. Um, the 15 is what uh, left fielder, right? I believe. Uh, let's go back here and take a look at the uh, fielding rules. There you go. 15 is a left fielder, yeah? See, I told you I know this by heart. Um, so, but uh, the left fielder here, um, uh, when we go look at the game, uh, is, uh, where is he? Is Musial, who has a two. So that'd be fielding two. Go back over here and take a look, though, and you'll see that um, with fielding two, the uh, 15 is actually hit by pitch. Normally, you wouldn't have to have little e. It's the internal system that changed that to an 18. Of course, that means we have to look at a different fielder. The fielder we're looking at here is uh, the shortstop, uh, which is Koenig. We looked at him last time. He has a 7. As if you remember, the 7 puts him in fielding 3. Look at the fielding rules. And um, for the shortstop, a 7 means fielding 3. And so we'll go back over here, look at the boards again. Fielding 3 against the shortstop is an error. right? And that's the reason why we have the little e rule. Didn't come up, though. And so we use instead the 25 rule which when we look at the um, fielding rules, a 25 is against the infield, uh, 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 the, what the infield group team rating, I guess we was what we call it, the infield fielding rating, which is the sum of the infielders, catchers, and pitchers fielding rating. Um, for the Yankees, that's a 32. It's calculated for us already. So that would be what? 32 is fielding two. That means that we look at fielding two when we look at the board. So we go over here to fielding two, 25 um, is a, uh, with a runner on first, normally would be a ground ball double play. See if we can figure out what happened here. So um, normally it would be that, but ah, you see Hoyt has this special DP minus uh, symbol. And so what happens as a result of the DP minus symbol is um, it's changed to a 26. So DP minus means it's a fielder's choice, same as 26 below. Runners out at second, batter safe at first. So that's what happened. That's kind of a mouthful, right? And I'm looking here at the time. This is taking longer than the game I just played, right, to record this and explain all of this. This is why I don't do this, right, because it does take a long time to go through and understand this. When you're playing this, basically you know that a 25 is going to be a double play with a runner on first almost all the time unless you have a DP minus, and you'd make a note of this and make a mental note to say, I have to slow it down, I have to check for the DP minus. Now... A lot of us who play this game won't play it right and will forget, you know, here's guilty as charged right over here. Sometimes I forget about the double play minus and you're like, oh, whoops. Or you forget weird things like when I play card and dice, I'd forget that there need to be three outs in an inning, not two, or that there were already three outs in an inning. It couldn't have four. Or I'd have guys scoring where they weren't on base and all sorts of weird things happen. Uh, it's good to have the computer game. We'll finish this inning up here and then we'll call it good, but see how long it sort of takes to get through the tutorial. Al Simmons now. And look at that. He rolls a 53. 53 is usually the air roll. It's a 17, which is um, the uh, right fielder. It'll be Babe Ruth. But see, this has changed. It's randomized to change to a 20, which involves the second baseman, Lazari. And that means that this is going to end up being an error because there are two outs and Cobb moves up. So we'll go take a look again. Originally, it was going to be a 17, right? So uh, let's see here. Yeah, it was going to be a 53 for a 17. 17 again, that um, involves uh, fielding rules. 17 is the right fielder. I have this memorized because app is the same way, and if you played enough app, you just know it by heart. 17 is the right fielder, Ruth, who has a two. So we go back over here, we see a two means fielding two, of course. It's pretty simple. Um, uh, go back over to the boards. A 17 with fielding two normally would have been a single to right, but this was changed. It was changed by the randomizer to a 20. So 20 means second baseman. 
Go back to the play game screen. Second baseman is Lazari, who has a seven. I don't remember off the top of my head if a seven is um, a fielding three or fielding two. So we go look this up. Seven is fielding two. Four, five, or six, or three. Eight and nine is one. You might be wondering, well, why even have this difference in numbers? It's all because of this um, infield fielding rating and also because of the total fielding rating. So there is sort of a method to the madness. There's a reason why it's kind of this way. That's just sort of the way that the system works. So go back over here to the boards again. So it's fielding two, and it was a 20. You can see normally it's out at first, runner to second, but with two outs, it's an error on the second baseman, and the runner goes to second. So there you have it, error on the second baseman, runner goes to second, and that brings up Sammy Hale. And that's the way that that's calculated. Here now is Sammy Hale. Normally when I play, you know, the game itself, I don't have to go through all these calculations because I know how to play. I've played, you know, thousands of games. But, um, you know, it's helpful sometimes to sit down and walk through it. So here's the Hale. Oh, and look at that. He rolls an 11. So 11 in this case is a zero. Zero means roll again. And uh, then you look at the second column rule. So first column zero for Sammy Hale, a second dice roll is needed. You have to roll twice. One of the few times you'll have more than one roll for an at-bat. And the second roll is what? It's a 44, which gives us a result of two, right? So one through six means that the pitcher doesn't have much of a say in what happens. Hoyt doesn't have any of these funny like letters or anything. And I mean, with the two, it's not going to matter anyway. We'll go back over here to the boards and look at this. This is with runners on first and second, a two as a home run to extreme right field, but if it's a second column two, you use play result number five, which is a triple to the right field bullpen. All right, so that's what it was. It was a triple, pretty simple. Um, and um, that's exactly what's written here. Second column two, same as PRN five, a triple. Second column reduction to PN, PRN five, triple to right field bullpen. So the game did exactly what we expected. And it's 2 nothing now for the Athletics. And uh, let's see what Mickey uh, Cochran can do. Still two away. You'll note that with two outs, you can't have the infield come in and you can't bunt. Obviously, you can't hit and run because the rules of the game, only with runner on first or runners on first and third can you bunt. So Mickey comes up, and his roll is a 63. We click on the 63. It's a 31. I know it's going to be a fly ball over to Combs in center field. But the way that this works is you look at Combs, he has a three, right? So 31 means it's going to be center field. We look at the advanced uh, fielding rules here. 31 is center field. Three means fielding one. Three is the higher number, so it's fielding one. It's a good thing. So we go back over to the boards, and we have fielding one, runner on a third base, uh, change this to fielding one. And the result is 31 is fly out, runner holds, and F scores. But, of course, it's the third out in the inning, so that uh, that means that it's, we're just going to be out of the inning no matter what, whether the uh, runner's fast or not. So there you have it, and uh, that's the first inning. The Athletics um, go and have a 2 nothing lead here in the first inning. It only took us about 25 minutes to get through it all. That's the way that Skeetersoft NP3 works. Now, I don't have the fan boards. If I had the boards in front of me, I'd show you. Um, it's organized kind of the same way. The boards are easier to see because when you look at uh, the uh, boards here, fieldings 1, 2, and 3 are in columns right next to each other. It's easier to see the difference. In places where there's no difference, it will just take up the whole line, right? So it's easier to read. It's much easier on the eyes than trying to click through everything. Um, there are other things that you just kind of know from playing it, like the fielding rules. You learn this as you play over and over and over again. You start to memorize which air number is which fielder and which thing involves whom and which ones involve the infield ratings. Then everything else is just the overall team rating. Usually when I was a kid, I would ignore most of this and just use the fielder ratings and sometimes use the infield ratings, right? I think only with air numbers would I actually pay that much attention to this, right? I mean, you kind of learn how to play it sort of your own way as you go along. Um, that's sort of the way that it works. Now, the pitching system makes it more complicated because you have to, uh, and it's over here on the boards, I'm sorry, um, it's because you have to pay attention to this stuff. Usually, I would sort of write down a note to myself and make sure to look at this after the inning. Basically, if you play it by hand, once you get past the base grade over to what the long-term grade is going to be, you're kind of set. Right, and you can see everybody, most of these guys have a base grade for the first couple innings and then they go down to the next grade down and then you wait until you get to the adjustment or until they start getting shelled, right? So that's kind of the way it works. It's not that hard when you're playing it by hand. It's not that hard to sort of get a feel for this. You know, the bunt play um, plays and stuff, the um, different uh, readings for that are also not that hard because for the most part, you're not going to have to worry about the pitcher. Um, hit and run. Sometimes you'll have to worry about the pitcher, but again, it's mostly self-explanatory. It's not really that bad. And it doesn't come up that often. 
Um, so that's the way it works. Now, when I was playing this, I know this is a sort of rambling on. When I was playing back in the old days, I'd have a table um, I would sit at, and it had to be a big enough table because I would have two copies of the pitching chart in front of me. I was playing 1924. I'd have uh, one copy that would be the starting pitchers. It'd be like over here. And then on the other side, I'd have another copy that would be the relief side so that when I had to change the relief pitchers, I didn't have to make sure I was on the right chart and stuff like that. All of that is, it gets to be kind of a pain. It really does get to wear you down after a little while. When you get into the flow of it, like I said, you can play a game probably as fast as 15 minutes or so, card and dice. Uh, that's assuming you don't get a whole bunch of guys on base. Um, it can be confusing. One problem I had playing card and dice is that I would forget what the original rule was if there was like a little E or if something funny happened. And so like, you know, I would get really confused and lost and be like, I can't remember, did I roll a, like, it was the result of 43 or a 44 or a 45, you know, stuff like that. And it does make a difference in the boards and you're like, you feel a little embarrassed. So um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the development of the NP3 computer game is nice. It started out actually as what they called the scorecard where you had to have the cards yourself um, and the scorecard would just let you do all this on the computer. And then eventually, you know, I think Cyrus convinced Bill that we can just sell the cards on the computer would be a little bit easier. I'm thankful for that because then I don't have to have a whole bunch of cardboard sitting around the house right um and uh, yeah that's basically the way that it works um it is a lot easier and faster when you play this on the computer and then you think maybe a little bit less about how the mechanics of the game work and a little bit more about okay well this is the situation this is what happened this is a good rule this is a bad rule and on and on anyway there you have it about 30 minutes uh, now for you that's the way that uh, the national pastime three game works from skater soft um it was actually pretty nice because we saw almost every single one of those kind of bizarre um, uh, little features come up. I think I might do a little bit more of this and we might play around with some of the um, options in the game and show you some other kind of weird stuff that can happen when you play with this. There's all sorts of options in the game, all sorts of things that can happen, all sorts of fun uh, you can have with it. So um, we'll take a look uh, a little bit later on and sort of show you different aspects of this game and how it works. And as always, let me know your feedback. Let me know what you like, what you don't like, and um, uh, I'll explain as much as I possibly can to you. Um, it's not that complex of a game, but I would argue that it's probably a little bit more complicated than Replay. I think it's more complicated slightly than the Stratomatic Advanced game. Um, uh, I would uh, probably put it maybe on par with the Strat Advanced game, maybe. Um, uh, it is definitely not as complicated as the App and Master game, that's for sure. The App and Master game is um, a real headache. Thank you, J. Richard Sides. Um, but we'll talk about that one later. Talk to you guys later then. Bye.